Hi, this is Larry Ruane. I'm going to be talking here about a pull request that I recently reviewed, 26152, Bump Unconfirmed Ancestor Transactions to Target Fee Rate. And uh, I'm not gonna be getting into so much of the detailed code or any of the detailed code in this, in this PR at all. This is more conceptual level stuff. And, and actually in reviewing this PR, I, I learned a lot of concepts that were useful, I think, for um, just a general understanding of, uh, of the mempool, how it works, um, how transactions are, are selected and so forth. And, and this is all related to this PR, but it's, um, it's things that it's more general knowledge than just, just this PR. So yeah, hope this is useful to people. Uh, let's see, um, in this diagram here, I just wanted to, first of all, I wanted to sh point out the conventions. I'm gonna be having the parent uh, transactions on the left and the children or descendants on the right in, in how I'm drawing this. And so here we're showing like in, in this picture, there's uh, some confirmed transactions. The transactions are these circles. So the transactions on the left are inside the squares because they're part of confirmed blocks. Um, the, the mempool transactions are to the right of this dashed line and um, they can have, uh, th they can spend, a, a, a child can spend <coughs> its ancestors' uh, parent uh, transactions outputs uh, either from confirmed blocks or, f or from mempool. So in this case, we have a child transaction that's spending one output from a confirmed transaction and one output from a, an unconfirmed transaction, the parent here. Um, the, the, the spends from the confirmed blocks I, I drew in dashed lines. Um, and actually, we, we really only care for the purpose of this, uh, of, of this presentation here. We're only gonna care about unconfirmed spends, uh, unconfirmed um, uh, in, uh, uh, outputs. So, um, this means that uh, all the stuff in the dash lines, we're just going to leave it off and, and not include it any, anymore in these diagrams. So there we simplified it. Um, this is showing just two mempool transactions, a parent and a child. And of course these have other, inf other uh, inputs referring to other, other um, UTXOs, but we're not, but those are all in confirmed blocks. We're not gonna show those. Um, in general in the mempool or even even in, in, in outside the mempool and in, in confirmed blocks, transactions can make this uh, this graph of of um, spends of um, relationships, and um, so here I showed it this pretty complicated general uh, graph. That this uh, uh, it's a uh, DAG um, directed asymptotic graph, um, and and I didn't show the arrows here, but the arrows are always going to be from you know, uh, pointing to the left because the, the children will be on the right and the parents will be on the, on the left. So, so this transaction here is a parent of this one. And then this one has a, has a, is a parent to this one and so forth. And, and this is like the great, great, great grandparent of this one and so forth. Um, one of the interesting properties here of the mempool is that, that mining always removes transactions from the left side of this graph, just the way I've drawn it. So you know, can't we, we can't like mine this individual transaction right here by itself, or 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 this one here because um, we we can't mine a transaction unless we mine all of its ancestors, <coughs> unless they're or unless they're already mined, or or unless we mine them in the same block. So so in this case, we could we could mine these here, just these one, two, three, four, five transactions. Um, that would be okay to do, and then we'd end up with this graph in the mem this set of transactions in the mempool, the other ones having been removed. Um, and then the other, on, on the other side, uh, we, we can add transactions to the right side of this, of this DAG and accept new transactions here on the right. Um, and again, we can't add transactions some arbitrary place here on the left because we can't, you know, we, we can't have transactions that refer to, um, you know, to non-existent parents. Every, every transaction, all of a transaction's parents have to already be known and exist. There's actually one exception to that. There's something called the orphanage. So if a node hears of a, of a transaction that uh, it doesn't have all of its parents, then it thinks, well, maybe it, you know, just because of timing, the way, you know, network vari variations in network timing, 
we might not have seen the parent yet. So what we can do is hold on to that transaction for a limited time. I think, I'm not sure how many seconds, but we'll hold on to a transaction for a short amount of time. And if, if its parents, if we don't have all of its parents within some time interval, then we'll drop the transaction and just ignore it. But um, this way, you know, if, if transaction, if parents and children come in out of order, we can still, um, you know, pro uh, not not uh, not lose anything. We can we can be tolerant of that. <coughs> but in everything I'm going to be saying here, I'm not talking about the or that orphanage at all. Uh, these these are all just regular transactions that are non non orphaned. Um, okay. So, and then so as I said, we can add new transactions here on the right. Um, that happens continuously. You know, even you know be between blocks. Whereas to back up one, back up two. You know, mining happens obviously on on block intervals, and uh, you know, average every 10 minutes. These these can happen continuously, adding to the right. So so you can think of the mempool as kind of a, a window, uh, a, a, a shifting window that this window that moves kind of left to right, as as we mine and receive new transactions. Okay, now to go back to the simple picture again, we have these just the, just the two transactions in the mempool, parent and child, and one of the things that's going to be really important for this uh, for what we're going to investigate here is the the, the uh, fees and the size the, and the fee the actually the fee rates so here we're going to just um, have an example of this this parent transaction has a fee of 300 satoshis it's always they're always in units of sats and it has a virtual size of 100 bytes and the child this child has 100 uh, fee and and size is 200 and and so we'll just draw separate those with a, with a slash uh, to, to show it's always um, it's always going to be fee over fee size here, um, and so then we can we can actually calculate uh, and a uh, fee rate. <coughs> so this is so for the one on the left, it's going to be uh, 300 over 100 is three sats per v byte, and the fee rate of this one is a thousand over 200 is five sats per, per v byte. Um, and one of the really important things here is is that's going to be important coming up is the ancestor fee rate. Um, this is going to be the uh, a, a transaction's own fee plus the fees of all of its ancestors, and then divided by the, the this uh, this given transaction's size plus the sizes of all of its ancestors. That's that's the ancestor or also called package fee rate so in this example on the one on the right it has a um, the numerator the, the the fees is 100 plus 300 and then all that divided by the size of this transaction is 200 and then plus the size of its parent is 100 so that's 300 1300 over 300 is 4.33 sats per v byte so that's the ancestor fee rate and this this idea of the ancestor fee rate only the concept only applies to unconfirmed transactions, and it, it depends only on you know on unconfirmed ancestors. We don't care about anything that's been mined as far as you know calculating fee rate. Um, let's see. And one of the things um, I should I should also mention here first is that is that the the um, every transaction has a has an ancestor fee rate, even if it doesn't have any ancestors, because uh, transactions ancestor fee rate includes itself. So um, I just mentioned that a minute ago. But like the one on the left, its fee rate is three, but also its ancestor fee rate is three, because it, it's only these, these same two numbers without, without any having any ancestors. And whereas this one, as I, as I already went over this one, its, um, its fee rate is 4.33. And one of the things uh, that's, that's good to keep in mind is with these fee rates is that you can never um, combine just fee rates alone uh, to come up with an ancestor fee rate. So, so if we if if all we knew was that this this transaction's fee rate is five, and that this one is fee rate is three, uh, we can't we can't um, calculate what the ancestor fee rate is of the one on the right of the child, because it's not it's not like we can take an average fees. You know, so average of five and three would be four. But the actual ancestor fee rate is, as we see here, 4.33. So, in all the kind of calculations we do with that involve fee rates, we always keep the fee and the size separated. Separated. We never, we don't actually do that division to calculate the fee rate until like the until the very last minute. 
and um, we keep them separate until then. Okay, let's see. So here's the same two transactions as before, but we've added a third one up here. Um, and let's say it has a ancestor, uh, it, has, it has a fee of 900 in size of 200, so its ancestor fee rate is, is 4.5, 4 and, and, and that's its ancestor fee rate is the same as its fee rate. Um, then, because now, now miners are going to prefer, or th what, they, what miners care about is ancestor fee rate, so as opposed to fee rate. So th a, a miner will always look at and, and say, um, well, for example, in this case, the miner will choose this one first because 4.5 is greater than 4.33. Um, and, and so even though um, this one here has a fee rate of five, um, the, the miner will actually choose this one, the, the 4.5 an ancestor fee rate before choosing this one because the fee rate again here doesn't matter because you can't, the miner can't choose just this transaction. It can only choose this transaction and all of its ancestors because they, because every, every um, transaction, to be, to be in a block, a transaction's uh, ancestors, you know, it's, what it's spending has to already exist, has to be known. So it has to, so, so the miner can only choose these two together, um, or it can choose this one here, just the one on the left. It can choose the parent by itself, or, but if it wants to choose the, the child, it has to choose the parent as well, all, all, of, its, in, in all of its ancestors. So uh, this, one's, this one up in the upper right corner is actually, has a higher ancestor fee rate than the, than the child down here in the lower right. Okay, so now if we change the hypotheticals just slightly here, so that the we let's let's uh, assume that this transaction had this parent a, as a parent, so now these are these two are actually sharing the um, the same parent, and an interesting thing ha happens with when you have this dependency is that this uh, this guy's fee rate will will decrease from from uh, 4.5 down to four because. Now this one's ancestor fee rate is going to be 300, or uh, this 900 here plus 300, di all divided by 200 plus 100, is, uh, which is 300. So that's four, and uh, so this reduces. So in general, well, we saw that with this one down here too. But in general, um, a an ancestor or parent can can drag down the the um, the ancestor fee rate of of a transaction. A transaction's fee rate might be higher by itself, but but its ancestors can quote drag it down, make it lower. Okay, so now suppose that a miner is, um, you know, miners know that they have to take take um, all the ancestors with a given transaction. So let's suppose a miner first considers the this combination of now I've labeled these transactions. So we have A, B, and C. So first a miner considers the the, the combination of A, A and B. And its ancestor fee rate is four, and let's say that um, that's not good enough to be included in the block. Suppose that you know to, to be included in this next block, just given all the other transactions that are, that are competing for you know for block space, that really it has to, you have to have an ancestor fee rate of 4.2 or or higher. Just as an example, so this one's not good enough. Uh, so this will not be you know so, so, uh, selected for to be included in the next block by a miner. Uh, now we now the miner t checks this one here. Let's say it considers uh, A and C together, and its fee rate is 4.33. Okay, so that's better than 4.2 higher. So this can go in the into the block template. Great. So the miner will now include this in the block template, or s you know, will select it. Um, and now, actually, the thing is, um, is that once that decision is made to include this in the block. Figuring out what else to add to the block template, it, you, you know, we can anticipate that A and C are no longer in the mempool because we can like look at look forward in time to where we assume that this is going to be now included in the block, so it's no longer in the mempool. So we can remove this from the from our view of the. This is just actually a view of the mempool. This is not the real mempool, but we're we're um, it's a sort of temporary view that the miner has in the mempool where, where it's removing things that it's going to include, in the, that it, it's decided to include in the block template. So if we remove, the, if we remove A and C, then, then B by itself, what's happened, C, is that it it's, uh, doesn't have a parent, an unconfirmed parent anymore. 
well, really it does, but, but it's already been selected for mining, so we can remove that arrow that was here before. So now its ancestor fee rate is back up to 4.5, and now maybe it can be mined. So it's just you know, kind of interesting because to go back a few slides here, remember first we, first we considered the miner considered th these two as a group, A, a and B, and decided, nope, this not, that's not a um, high enough fee rate to, to be included in the block. So it, it went on and then considered A and C and it ended up deciding, yes, I'll take that. But now, once it did that, now, now if we go back and reevaluate B, and now because it doesn't have that parent A anymore, now it's okay, it's, its fee rate is higher than 4.2, which we were imagining is the cutoff. So now, now B can be included in the block. So the, the main point I want to get across here is that, is that is in this squiggle stuff here, is that mining, uh, or, or you know, selecting to be mined, a, a, a package or you know, a, a, pa a transaction and its ancestors, affects the ancestor fee rates of all of the descendants of the transactions that were selected. So, so like in this case again, whoops, uh, did the wrong thing. So in this case again, by selecting these, then because because B is a descendant of A, then B's um, ancestor fee rate can change because when we select A and C, then then and, and if and if and if A had other descendants and if C had other descendants, you know, not shown here, then all of those they could have all of their uh, their ancestor fee rates could change, in general would change. Okay, so that's the, the main point there. So just to um, to make it more li a little more general generalize this this concept here, if we had a high fee rate transaction here. That spending is that has a low fee rate parent here. Then you know, as as we already said, the this uh, this transaction elk is sort of dragged down H's uh, ancestor fee rate, right? Um, but if it if if there's another if if uh, if this low low fee uh, parent has another child, let's call it H2, and and if H2 has a is, is a high is a high fee rate transaction, then it can end up you know being selected for to be included in the block and, 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 and to be mine, which would include L. And then that would, that would then boost H's uh, ancestor fee rate. So we, were just, we just went through that. But, but see, what I want to show now is that, is that if, if it turned out that, that um, this H2 had another low fee rate parent here, then, it could, then that, this L here could drag down this H's uh, fee rate low enough, ancestor fee rate low enough so that now H2 does not get mined very quickly, you know, and, and so this, that would mean that, that would mean that H still has this L here, has, still has this parent L. So, so the fact that this L happened up, you know, this L exists up here could affect the, um, you know, the, the, the eventual a ancestor fee rate of, of this H here. Um, so <laughs> it, it gets pretty weird. So, so then, um, this is a, I made it even crazier. So, in theory, like see all of these, if you had this kind of a, a, a arrangement here, then in theory, um, all of these guys' fee rates here, um, they could affect, eventually affect H's, you know, our original um, transactions ancestor fee rate, depending. So, um, so in other words, for, for these algorithms, for like, so for the miner to decide which transactions to, to include in the block, um, it really actually needs to look at um, all of these like connected transactions here, the anything that's that's um, that's related in in any way. As, uh, so, in other words, not just it doesn't just look at a transaction and its ancestors or and, and, and you know or descendants directly, like grandparents and or parents and grandparents and so on, but it also needs to know it has to it has to consider um, siblings and and then cousins. There's, I think that might be a cousin or something. Second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins. <laughs> so um, uh, one of the things that I think there's, uh, I thought when I wrote this that mempool policy limits the cluster size to to 100 transactions, and I found out later this is wrong. So ignore this comment. I don't. It's more complicated than that. But there's there's some kind of limit on how big these clusters. This is called a cluster. That are all these in, all these transactions that have some relationship to each other. Um, so really, the the overall mempool is like a set of these independent clusters. They're independent from each other, but within the cluster, they have some connection, like there's some relationship. But anyway, um, the the mempool policy I thought was that the, the, these clusters limited to 100 transactions, but that's not correct. I found it later, so ignore that part. Okay, so that's that's just talking about mining, and now let's talk about 
what sounds like something maybe uh, unrelated, but it turns out it's very much related, is, is uh, transaction construction by the wallet, and especially fee determination. So how do the wallet's got to determine what decide what kind of fee to put on the transaction that it's creating. And so you'll see, but many of the same, of these same uh, concepts will appear there as in mining. So <coughs> let's see. Um, what, let's take an example here where we have, in the mempool, we have just these two, or we have this one transaction. We're trying to, we're trying to existing in the mempool, but then we have um, a transaction that we're trying to construct. So the dash circle here represents uh, that it's under construction. So we're going to, we're trying to make this, the wall is trying to create this transaction. So part of creating the transaction is to decide on the fee. What, what should the fee be? So let's suppose we know the size because we know how, you know how big this input is and how big this input is. The, this input's going to a mind, uh, an already mined block here, but um, th this input's, let's say we know is coming from, from this, uh, this ancestor here or this parent, and um, and then we know, and then I'm not showing anything about outputs, but there's outputs here too and stuff. So we know how big this transaction is. Let's say it's 100 V bytes. That's probably small for real life, but just for illustration, uh, it's 100 V bytes here. And now we have to decide what what kind of fee to put on this. Now, the when when a when a user wants to you know create create an, and and broadcast a transaction, the user has in mind some fee rate. So let's suppose the, the desired fee rate is two Satoshis per, per V-byte. And of course that affects how uh, the priority of this transaction in terms of mining. So the more, you know, the higher fee rate will, will be mined sooner. So if, if you, so the user has some idea of, of how, what time frame that is this transaction should be mined in. So and we'll choose, and then depending on the, mar on, on the rest of the networks, um, the, d d the demand for block space, will det determine you know, what, um, what fee will be chosen here. So, but the user has a control over this. So let's say the desired fee rate's two uh, sats per V byte. Um, now, so we do something like really, really um, obvious and, and uh, um, you know, simplistic. We'll just say, well, okay, uh, two, the fee rate two times the size t is, is that means that the fee should be 200. So we can do, we can make this fees, this one's fee at 200 here, but, now we look at the ancestor fee rate. We find out that well, no, because the ancestor fee rate is this fee 200 plus this an, uh, this uh, ancestor or parent's fee is 100 divided by the this, these two sizes added together. That's that's 1.5. So that's too low. So here we made a transaction that you know just the simplistic way that turned out to have its fee rate was lower than it we than it should have been or than was requested. So. So that's really what this PR does. This this um, PR is to uh, uh, this is what happens today. Is that this fee rate is just um, simplistically determined, but the the PR will, is going to make that determination of the fee rate more uh, accurate. Make it make it make it not not be not be too low. Okay. So in this case, how do we fix this? Well, we would just it, you can pretty easily see that if we change the fee to from 200 instead of, instead of 200, we make it 300. Then the ancestor fee rate will be 300 plus 100 divided by 100 plus 100, and that's two. So this is called bumping the uh, um, the ancestor fee rate. It, it's just a terminology that's used here. So this is, I think, a slightly confusing term because um, you know we're not changing anything about this tra this transaction that the, the ancestors. Uh, fee rate. We we can't. It's 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 immutable. We can't change this transaction. But what we can do is change our own fee rate, so that in effect, we're we're th th it's, it's as if this this trend this parent has a higher fee rate. So that's why we call it bumping the ancestor fee rate. Um, uh, let's see. Another thing is this this you may re recognize too. This is exactly like c CPFP child pays for parent, except the difference is that our intention in this case. Is we're just trying to create a payment transaction. That's all. We're just this is actually to pay somebody. Not the purpose of this transaction is not just to bump this one to get this one mined. That would be CPFP. But instead, we're just trying to create a payment transaction. And this payment transaction though happens to use an unconfirmed input uh, or an unconfirmed output. Th this one right here, unconfirmed UTXO. So it's it's the, the intention is different, but it's a similar idea as CPFP. 
Okay. Um, now notice that if the unconfirmed, uh, if, the, if this one's parent's um, fee was higher, if it happened to be 200, then we wouldn't have to do anything at all because the, the this because these two together, fee rate is is already two, and and so um, we don't have to quote bump the the ancestor here at all. And in general, um, if if our ancestor ancestor's fee rate is greater or, or equal to our own, then then we don't need to bump it. It's, we can just we can just treat it as if it's already been mined. So. Um, okay, so in this this case we've been going over, we knew upfront which UTXOs we wanted to use. So it's it's easy to uh, to calculate the the simplistic fee and then to adjust it. We know we know exactly how to adjust the fee to uh, to so that we can um, have the uh, uh, the correct overall fee rate. So we knew which t we we knew already which UTXOs, but the more common case or realistic case, I guess, would be that we're using automated coin selection to do that for us. So um, uh, you might hear the, the term coin control. That's kind of what we just went over. So coin control is where the, the user decides which coins or which UTXOs to spend. And uh, that gives you the most control, but it's also the most, uh, the most effort, most work. So what, um, what's more common probably is is where um, you let the wallet choose the the coins to 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 spend on the inputs, um, and so Bitcoin for wallet, and, and all wallets have have some some form of co coin selection to automate that process. Um, and actually, yeah, let's take a brief detour about about using coin selection to choose unconfirmed UTXOs, because what we I want to um, go over a concept there that's going to be very useful later for uh, back on the PR again when we, when we get back to the PR. But first, let's talk about about confirmed UTXOs. So here's a, I made a picture of just uh, this this arbitrary graph of of UTXOs that um, and actually they don't these don't even have to be connected. I should shouldn't have even used that that same picture because these could just be some random UTXOs that we that we can spend. So the the filled in circles here are. Are, have a UTXO that that we can spend the outputs that we have the we have the you know private keys so so that's available to sp to make the new transaction. Here's the new transaction. This this dash circle here. So the way the wallets work, all, all of these wallets work in Bitcoin Core Wallet Two, is that the wallet will will um, will tell Coin Selection, which is this this um, piece of software that 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 chooses which UTXOs to to use for constructing the new transaction, um, it will tell Coin Selection uh, how much value is needed, um, and I'll get a little more into that exactly what that what that is later, how that's decided. But but how much value is needed on, on you know on the output side of this new transaction, and then it also provides a list of the available UTXO values. So it'll just be a list of numbers of you know, now this is a very high level conceptual. But it'll be just a list of, of you know, what the output value is that we can spend from this transaction, and what the output value is of this one, and so forth, of all the ones that we we have the, you know, the, the keys for, and and then what uh, what coin selection does is it finds a combination of these of those of those numbers of those list of, among that list of values. It finds a combination that will be you know, um, equal to or as close as possible to, but not less than. The, uh, the 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 total value that's needed, and coin selection itself. I'm not. We're not going to talk about that here at all. That's actually a huge topic in it, in and of itself, and it's pretty complicated. And there's and Bitcoin Core includes numerous includes I believe three coin separate coin selection algorithms, and and um, the wallet runs all three of them. And then and, and there's other criteria for how to choose these UTXOs. So th there's a lot to that. But we're gonna we're gonna skip all that or, or not get into any of that and just treat coin selection as a black box. So we're just, so this is, this is the, the interface I, that, that I'm, uh, I care about for the coin selection for, for the purpose of this talk. It's just the total value and then the list of value, the list of, you know, sub values or UTXO values that we have available to spend. Okay, so 
<clears throat> what gets tricky about this, though, is that see the th that that total value I mentioned. That first thing is the total value. That needs to include the fee. Needs to include include needs to include how much we're trying to pay somebody, but it also needs to include the fee. But the problem is that the fee depends on the inputs, on how many inputs, and even which particular inputs are chosen. So, um, you know, the the number and, and how many, uh, how large, how large each input will be depends on the specific you know UTXOs cho UTXOs that are chosen. But coin selection is going to choose those for us. We don't know ahead of time. So how can we give ch coin selection a, a, a value that will cover the fee without knowing ahead of time which which of these UTXOs the, the co coin selection algorithm will choose? So this is you can think of it as a chicken and egg problem. So we we you know we, we don't know if we knew if we knew all exactly which coins were going to be chosen, then we could calculate the fee. But then the fee is needed, or you know the, t the total the total um, uh, the total um, uh, output amount. Will is is needed for deciding which UTXOs to to, to select. So um, the the solution to this was a brilliant idea that called effective value ev effective value adjustment or something. And uh, I wish I had the PR number. I could. It was a few years ago, and uh, there was a uh, pretty major PR to 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 address this problem. And what what it is the way it works is the solution is is to tell coin selection that. <coughs> That the that the the value we need on the output on the output side of this of this new transaction is the amount we want to send to somebody else, plus the fee needed to pay for the outputs because we we could have multiple outputs even uh, the outputs and the transaction header, which is just a fixed you know this I think it's like 16 bytes or something that every transaction has as a header, version number and a few things so so that's a fixed size so that's easy. But um, and we know the outputs. We already we know the outputs already. So this this amount is is we can f determine precisely what this what what this value should be. So this is the value we give to coin selection. But then for the UTXO values, what we do is is instead of just giving the values of these out of, of the outputs that we have available to spend to you know, th those exact numbers um, uh, output amounts to coin selection, we reduce each of those. By the fee that would be needed at, 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 the, at the requested fee rate, the fee that would be needed to to spend that e each of those outputs. So, in other words, we lie to coin selection. <laughs> um, so, by giving coin selection smaller values and telling it to find, let's so here's a, like a kind of a quick example that we, we let's say we want to we want we were asking coin selection to come up with a combination of values that adds up to five PTC uh, uh, or more, uh, as close as possible to five, but at minimum five. So. It will so it it will select uh, UTX because we are telling it smaller. We're reducing the the, the values of these uh, of, of these um, UTXOs that in, in that list we're giving it of the of the UTXO values. Um, it will actually find select UTXOs that actually add up to say 5.01 BTC because we because we told it slightly lower numbers, and this 0 0.01 difference will increase the fee because uh, Remember that the fee is the sum of the inputs minus the sum of the outputs. So if if so the by lying to, by lying to coin selection and telling it smaller uh, val values for these for these uh, outputs, um, then then uh, coin selection will come up with a larger number and 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 that a, a larger total that will be the um, I on the input side of this transaction. So the, the total inputs of this will be a little bit larger. The inputs will be larger, and and, and if you look at this expression again, the if the inputs are larger, then then the fee is larger because the inputs the fee is the inputs minus the outputs. So just to give a, a real world example here, if, if if the actual UTXO values are these numbers here and, and you know this number of BTCs, then we tell coin selection that they are see these slightly lower numbers. Um, if the fee Needed to spend these outputs is are, are all like 100 sats, and if I got the right number of nines there, this 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 is what the the effective values or the reduced values are that we give to coin selection. So that's a really brilliant idea. I think that's um, um, works beautifully. Now let's return to to spending unconfirmed trans. So everything I said just there was uh, uh, applies to conf spending confirmed transactions. Um, but now let's go back to unconfirmed transactions, and but now using coin selection instead of uh, speci specifically knowing which which UTXOs we're going to spend. 
<coughs> so here, here in this case, I just have that same picture again, but this time let's pretend that these are all in the mempool and that these are all not confirmed. And so today, uh, without the PR, if coin selections happens to choose uh, a low fee rate transaction, that will drag down our the, the effective fee rate of this of the one we're constructing below what the user requested. So we we already covered that a little bit earlier. Um, and then I say here, t uh, confirmation time is uncertain, but users will be annoyed if you know <laughs> if the if the uh, if the effective fee if the end if the um, transaction fee rate is lower than you know, which is which is its ancestor fee rate is lower than um, what the user asked for, then then that's going to be bad because it, it's going to take longer to confirm that transaction. Um, so again, like kind of we covered we covered this earlier, but when when coin selection, when using coin selection, we don't know which UTX will be chosen. So the solution is very similar. We further reduce the effective value of all the unconfirmed the unconfirmed UTXOs. Um, at least the ones whose the, the ones whose ancestor fee rate is less than our desired, the, the ones that we need to bump. Because remember, we had that concept of bumping the ancestor fee rate. So we've already reduced the the, the effective value for the for the outputs that we might spend for that other reason, you know, so that the so that the, we can have a fee to pay for the inputs. But we we further reduce it in order to fee bump. So uh, in order to fee bump the. Um, the, the, this transaction's overall, you know, fee rate to to the what what the, what's the, what the user asked, requested. So that's exactly what this PR does. Two six one five two. It does this, which I think is genius. Uh, so here I gave a I have a few specific you know, exam, um, examples where let's say we had these four available unconfirmed UTXOs here, and um, and they have these ancestor fees and sizes here, and then this is like the nominal. Output values and well, actually, this should be already reduced by the other reason, the, the first reason, where where you know we have to reduce them in order to uh, create a create a fee to, to spend them. So we we're we're not talking about that here. We're, that's already been done. So this has already been reduced for that reason. But what we're going to find here is that now, let's say that we have an unconfirmed UTXO that's got these two values for fee and size, and if if our our new transaction, the target is the, what we want the fee rate to be is 10. Then the 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 uh, um, calculation we can do here is just is this this 10 times the size of this uh, of this output, unconfirmed output, is is 100, and then minus the fee. So let's take this this first row here. 10 times 100 is 1,000 minus 600. 400, so that we have, we're, we're going to reduce the effective value instead of 0.8, we're going to reduce by 400 sats, which is this this amount here, 0.799. This is a this is what we give to coin selection. This this rightmost column here. So just to take a couple more examples, like the um, if the ancestor fee is zero, is it? Which you might you might wonder, well, how can that even get in the mempool? How can we have an un unconfirmed UTXO with a zero fee? Well, actually, with pa with package relay. Which is coming soon. We're, we will be able to do this. I think today you can't do this, but um, in the future you'll be able to do this. So if we had, if, if this transaction that we we that we are going to have as a possibility for for coin selection has a zero fee and this size, and here's its output value three three point one, then just follow that same formula. Ten times the size is two is uh, two thousand five hundred minus the fee that's already being paid zero. So that's 2,500 is the effective value reduction. So instead of 3.1, it's 3.0999 or whatever, 75. Um, and then this this example here, I wanted to show you the third the third row is a case where look at this this ancestor has um, or, or it's available UTXO to spend <coughs> is um, its uh, its fee rate is actually 11 sats per it's 5,500 over 500 is 11 um, sats per V byte. That's higher than our than our target 10. So when we use this uh, same calculation here, um, it, it works out to be a ne this works out to be a negative number. Um, so in that case, we 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 clamp it to zero. We don't we you know this this, this is <laughs> we never do never we never do a fee reduction of a negative number. That doesn't make any sense. So this this one will need not need any bump at all of fees. So the the value we give to coin selection is 0 
And then here I just have one more example that's just uh, nothing really uh, uh, too, too crazy about this one, but uh, let's see, 10 times 400 is, is 4,000, uh, and then minus the fee of 80 is 3,920, uh, 3, and then we subtract that from five. So you see that it's a pretty straightforward calculation that we do there. Um, so here's that. Here's actually that that um, that same algorithm. Just try to write it more as as, a, as an algorithm. It's very high level still. <laughs> so what we do is we're we're given a list of of unconfirmed from the wallet, unconfirmed spendable UTXOs, and and uh, and actually you know you know the wallet knows the wallet has a list of all the spendable UTXOs, unconfirmed or not. But the part we care about here is just the unconfirmed spendable UTXOs. And what we do is we expand that that list. That might be like you know t uh, 10, 10 UTXOs or something. But w then we find the, the cluster, which remember we covered that earlier. So that's like all the related transactions, all related ones. So that might increase the, the, the list from say 10 to 20 or 50 or something like that. Um, so now we have this cluster. What we do is we, we enter a loop here and we sort, we, we actually first we sort by, um, uh, well, we, we sort by the best ancestor fee rate across this entire cluster. So wh which, which transaction that, we can, that, w that, that has an output we can spend, because remember, we're making a new transaction, so we're trying to find in, um, you know, outputs we can spend, and this is all unconfirmed. So we find a transaction, unconfirmed transaction, with an output that we can spend that has the best ancestor fee rate, the highest. And if this is lower than our target, uh, then, then we can break, and uh, you'll see why in a second why we break there. That might not be super clear, but, but, it, but if it's not the case, so if this has a higher ancestor fee rate than our target, and this this highest this highest ancestor fee rate that we have left in the cluster ha is higher than our target, then what we can do is like fake mine that transaction and all of its ancestors, and th and, and as I mentioned before, that requires recalculating the ancestor fee rate of all the descendants of all of those mine transactions, including the ancestors. So all of those get recalculated, the, the ancestor fee rates get recalculated, but, but the mining sort of like we pretend that they're no longer in the mempool. We, we take them out um, because they're, they're, you know, they're not needed. We don't need to bump those. We don't need to, bu uh, to bump their fee rate. So that changes this, so, so doing this changes the best remaining, you know, th this, this calculate, this function, and I didn't actually show you any implementation for this, but That'll change the results of this find best ancestor fee rate uh, across the cluster, and actually things will be removed. So for, by t for two reasons, Th things things will be removed from the cluster because they're quote mined, but also they're um, the, the 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 ones that are that are still remaining in the cluster. Some of them will have their ancestor fee rates recalculated. So then that's going to change the result of this. So we just stay in that loop and we keep like quote fake mining things that that and these are really just we're mining things that we don't need to fee bump. So that's but once we once we find one that's here, th then this if is true, then um, we we don't then we do need to fee bump this one and anything lower that um, that that we might end up using as 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 an input. So then what we do is we enter a, a, a second loop here, <coughs> where for each spendable UTXO. So this is not even like ev all the UTXOs in the cluster, which is that larger set, but the subset that's just the spendable UTXOs. We say if if it's mined. Um, that's what we determined that in that earlier loop. Um, we mined a bunch of things. So if if, it, if this particular one is mined, then the fee bump that we need to apply is zero because we you know we don't have to fee bump it. But otherwise else, we calculate the fee bump needed to bring this TX's ancestor fee rate up to the target our own target fee rate. So that's and that's like that calculation I showed a few slides back where. We have the table and everything, so that that's a pretty simple calculation there. But we calculate that fee bump needed, and so we do that for all of the ones that we that 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 we're going to hand to over to um, to coin selection, and so some will have fee bumps to zero, some will have you know positive fee bumps, and we return that list of of all the spendable UTXOs and their fee bumps, um, and, and we'll actually and then from that we calculate the, the the value reduction, you know, the effective value reduction. Give that to coin selection. I'm not showing you that here. Give that to coin selection, and um, and then, yeah, then then whatever coin selection comes up with, we'll, we'll we'll have the fees to do that bumping. So it's very ingenious. I I think this is brilliant brilliant stuff. 
Um, okay, one, one, last, one last point, one last refinement that, w that we can make here is that things get, things get a little bit um, um, imprecise, or we, we, we'll ma we might make a, m uh, a slight mistake here if um, two, two UTXO, these are UTXOs that, that we can spend, you know, that, that we are giving to coin selection, but they have a common ancestors, if they have any common ancestors. So let's suppose, for instance, we, that we have these two U1, U2, our spendable mempool UTXOs, and um, we can calculate their fee bumps like I, like I just went over. Um, and they'll, but they'll both include the fee bumps needed to, to quote mine, you know, the, the, the these, these and, their, and their parent, you know, that um, the, the fee bumps needed to, well, not to mine exactly, but to, to, to bring them up to the, the, the fee that we, that, that we need for our transaction. So we're gonna calculate some fee bump for U1 that depends on P and, and then completely independent of that, we'll calculate a fee bump for U2 for that output that, w that, that will depend on P. And, um, and that's good because, see the thing is if, if coin selection chooses one or, see that so far that's not a mistake. We wanna do that because if coin selection chooses only one or the other of these, let's suppose it chooses only one, then everything's perfect. We've done the exact precise calculation. But the problem is if it happens to choose both, <laughs> Because then, if it chooses, if coin selection decides to choose to spend, create the new transaction spending from U1 and U2, then we're bumping more than we need to because we're bumping for for P twice. We really, you know, we're double bumping P. So we're 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 we're, we're going to be we're going to be paying too much fee, not by a lot, but you know, a little bit too much fee. So to make this really perfect. Um, what the algorithm fixes this, what it does is, is after coin selection, so now we know all the UTXOs that we're actually gonna be spending, right? Then we generate a deduplicated list of these ancestors, of, of, you know, of, of all, all the ones we're spending plus their ancestors um, of, of the selected transactions, see, selected by coin selection. We, we, we uh, generate a deduplicated de list of all those and we sum Actually, you know, I just noticed something. I don't think this isn't quite accurate because I just noticed um, we can actually just take the the UTXOs that we're that we're spending because we already know their ancestor fee rates. So it's not like we have to go and look at all of their ancestors and so forth recursively. All we really need is the ones we the ones that are selected. We take their. Um, oh wait, no, sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. Um, we do actually have to go investigate. We have to go and and gather up a list of all of the ancestors. That's right. Sorry about that. All the ancestors, but we deduplicate it. So, like in this case, the the ancestors would be so. So, if U1 and U2 are chosen by coin selection, then the then the that that list that deduplicated list will be U1, U2, and P, not U1, U2, and P and P, <laughs> because we do duplicated. So then, what we do is we just we just calculate the um, the, the the fee bump needed for this deduplicated you know, reduced list of transactions, which is just the target fee rate time, target fee rate times the sum of the V sizes of U1, U2, and, and P, the, their, their V sizes. That's the fee bump we really need. And, and then the fee bump that we actually, you know, calculated ahead of before coin selection will be a, will could be a bigger number if we have this, if we have this common ancestor stuff. So then what, what we would do is take that difference, like what the difference between the original fee bumps, so the sum of all the fee bumps across all those UTXOs, and then, um, and, and then, or that's actually not quite right. It's like the fee bumps we needed for the ones that were selected, but individually, and that number will be higher than this, than this deduplicated fee bump needed. And then the difference, what we can do is add that to the change output because otherwise we'll be paying too much in fees. Now, if we don't have a change output, because it depends on exactly how close we got, you know, to the, um, to, to meeting the exact uh, needed, uh, needed value on the output side. So if we don't have um, a change output, then we could, then there's a, uh, an a two options there because we could either make a change, out change output and, and just, you know, have its value be like, have it be this difference um, and then also minus the, the, the fee needed for the change output. <laughs> but if that would just be dust, or uh, just, you know, so, so, so such a tiny amount, then we could just say that, ah, forget it, we'll just not even make, you know, we won't be able to spend that change output later probably. So 
we'll just not even make the change output and then let the um, let the fee be a little bit higher than it needs to be. So you know that just means the fee, the overall fee rate of this, you know, of this transaction will be higher than what was requested. But no one would really complain about that. No one really cares if you have a fee rate that's that's a little bit too high. Um, it just means it'll get confirmed a little sooner. That's all. So that's all I have, and um, I hope you got something out of this. And feel free to get in touch with me. Um, my e email address is LarryRuane at gmail.com. And if you forget that, just look on the, you can always look on the, um, the GitHub, uh, uh, um, the Bitcoin Core uh, commit history. And if you just search for, if you could just remember Larry or any part of my name, you'll find, you'll find commits there by me. So then you'll be able to find me. And I'm also on Twitter and I'm on also on IRC. So thanks a lot and um, talk to you all later. Bye.